all right students let's talk about sleeping disorders uh, so when we talk about sleep disorders before talking about the disorders per se let's brush up the uh, knowledge about sleep physiology a bit so we know about electroencephalograms eeg so eeg is basically used to measure the electrical activity of brain uh, like we use ecg for heart we use eeg for brain and when we do eeg we can uh, identify certain rhythms which are called as eeg rhythms uh, specifically we talk about the alpha rhythm beta rhythm theta rhythm and delta rhythm so let's talk about those alpha rhythm uh, the frequency of alpha rhythm is basically 8 to 12 hertz and the amplitude is between 50 to 100 micro volt now uh, when you go to bed and when you lie down and when you close your eyes initially what happens is you are lying on the bed with eyes closed you have yet not fallen asleep but you are thinking about something your mind is wandering if at that time somebody were to do an eg of yours uh, the alpha rhythm is what would be predominating so uh, eyes closed person is still awake and mind wandering right if somebody were to do your eg at this point of time when you are listening to me when you are trying to focus attention so at this point of time your eg would be full of beta waves but beta rhythm would be there right it is a awake pattern when the attention is focused on something now so uh, it goes like this you are studying you have beta wave you get bored you uh, switch off the mobile or you switch off the tablet you lie down on the bed you close your eyes from beta rhythm you go to alpha rhythm but you are still awake now finally you start falling asleep you drift into sleep the moment you drift into sleep drift into sleep uh, you go into nrem1 the sleep starts and now the theta rhythm starts to show up from transition from wakefulness to sleep and after some time as the uh, uh, as you proceed further into the nrem as you go towards nrem 3 and 4 the delta rhythm starts to show up so beta alpha theta and delta and these are the corresponding frequencies and amplitudes i'm sure you must have read about all these things in the physiology too all right so uh, we know that there are two stages of sleep we have got nrem sleep or non rapid eye movement sleep and the rem sleep or rapid eye movement sleep so let's talk about those NREM or non rapid eye movement sleep is also called as slow wave sleep and the REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep is also called as paradoxical sleep. Now first let's talk about NREM sleep. Now we can further divide the NREM sleep into four stages NREM stage one stage two stage three and stage four. So the first one is stage one and it is a light sleep. Why light sleep? It is easy to uh, awake a person. Uh, when he is in stage 1 and REM sleep it's a light sleep as i said the eg starts showing loss of alpha waves when your eyes were closed but you were still awake there were alpha waves when you start going when you go into stage 1 those are lost and the theta waves uh, become predominant now after that you go into stage 2 and REM sleep the stage 2 and REM sleep is characterized by two things there are two typical findings the first one is what is called as sleep spindles now these sleep spindles Basically, it's a regular rhythm and the frequency is somewhere around 12 to 15 hertz, right? Sleep spindle is burst or burst of regular wave. Uh, the frequency is around 12 to 15 or 13 to 15. This is what they look like. And then there are intermittent big waves, right? Big high voltage spikes which are called as K complexes. Now, many a times this figure is shown to you in the exams. And in fact, uh, if they show you a figure of uh, uh, EG and they ask a question about the sleep, which particular stage of sleep this this eg represent most likely the answer is nrem2 this is what they show again and again so this big ones are k complexes and this is sleep spindle now another important thing about nrem stage 2 is it is the uh, longest uh, uh, stage uh, the person while sleeping spends maximum time in the stage 2 nrem all right after that we talk about the stage 3 nrem now this is a deep sleep nrem 3 and 4 and in NREM3, basically the delta waves start to show up. The sleep deepens. It is difficult to awaken a person from the NREM3. And finally, the person goes into the stage 4, which is the deepest, difficult to awaken the person, and the delta waves become prominent. All right, so these are the four stages of NREM sleep. When we talk about the REM sleep, uh, before that, NREM sleep is also characterized by a couple of things. First of all, there is pulsatile release of certain hormones especially gonadotropins and growth hormones uh, most of the uh, autonomic activity kind of slows down the bp goes down the heart rate goes down the respiratory rate also goes down so these are some of the things seen in an rem sleep 
Uh, let's talk about the REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. Uh, it is called as REM because it's a lot of movement of eyeballs. And uh, in uh, EG, the uh, REM sleep's EG is quite similar to the EG that we see when a person is awake because there are a lot of beta waves. Uh, and there is also alpha wave which comes back once the person shifts from an REM4 to uh, REM sleep. Now, uh, apart from uh, these EG changes, a lot of changes happen in the body too. Uh, there is loss of muscle tone. Uh, in the rest of the body, the muscle tone is lost, but the eyeballs are moving a lot. There is rapid movement of eyes and uh, the metabolism of the brain also increases. The metabolism of brain increases and most of the autonomic functions, they also increase. For example, there is increased heart rate, there is increased respiratory rate and even the uh, BP also increases. Now, it is also associated with spontaneous penile erections. In REM sleep, there are spontaneous penile erections and we use this fact to differentiate the psychogenic ED from the organic ED. We'll talk about that later. Now, dreams. Uh, we dream in both an REM sleep as well as REM sleep. In both non-rapid eye movement sleep as well as rapid eye movement sleep, we dream, but we recall only those dreams that we saw in the REM sleep. So, remember that dreams that we can recall are, were, were seen in the REM sleep. Now, it is also, REM sleep is also referred to as paradoxical sleep. Why? Because uh, although the EG is showing beta waves, right, but at the same time, it is very difficult to arouse a person or wake up a person when he is in REM sleep. So, it's difficult to wake him up, but the EG is showing as if he is very active or uh, the EG is quite reminiscent of or quite similar to that of uh, a period when you are awake. So, that is why it is called as paradoxical sleep. Now, this is something which is uh, uh, mostly asked in physiology, but I have just included it. So, pontogeniculo occipital spikes. Now, these are large waveforms, large potentials, which, which originate in the pons, the cholinergic neurons of pons, and then they go to the LGB, lateral geniculate body, and finally, they are seen uh, in the occipital cortex area. So, remember that sometimes they ask this question, pontogeniculo occipital spikes, uh, associated with the REM sleep. Now, uh, if we talk about the duration uh, of these uh, all these stages, most of the time is spent in the NREM sleep. So, say we are talking about an eight hour period, almost six point or six to six point five hours are spent in the NREM sleep, a maximum in the NREM two, and the remaining one to one and a half hours are spent in the REM sleep. Now, the NREM three and four, the deep sleep, most of the NREM uh, four especially. Uh, happens in the first one third of the sleeping time, whereas most of the REM happens in the last one third of the sleeping time, right? And REM sleep happens every one and a half hours and there are almost four to five REM uh, sleep periods per night. Now, the interesting thing is uh, when you try to cut down on your sleep duration, say your exams are coming and you think that uh, normally I sleep for eight hours, but I'll start sleeping from for seven hours from now. That one hour is usually deducted from the REM sleep. It does not impact the NREM sleep as much. And REM sleep is also, also the time where the long-term processing happens as far as the memory is concerned. Long-term memory is kind of made during REM sleep. So, if you are cutting down on your sleep period, you are basically taking it away from the REM sleep. And the problem is, though you add one more hour to your daytime, whatever you read, whatever you study is not able to get consolidated in the memory. So, it actually uh, backfires. It, it creates more problem than it solves. You want to add one hour more, but despite adding one more hour, your efficiency would go down because you would not be able to transfer stuff into the long-term memory. So, it's a, it's a very strong advice. Never ever try to increase your daytime by cutting down on your sleep time. Don't ever do that. It, it doesn't work. All right, let's talk about the sleep disorders. Now, sleep disorders can be divided into two broad categories. The first one is dysomnias and the other one is parasomnias. Let's talk about dysomnias first. So, basically what happens in dysomnia is there is a disturbance in either the duration of sleep or the quality of sleep. So, we can discuss these disorders by dividing them into uh, the disorders that present with hypersomnia, more sleep or insomnia, less sleep. Let's talk about hypersomnia first. Now, there are two disorders uh, which primarily present with hypersomnia. Uh, the first one is uh, narcolepsy. Now, it's an extremely important disorder as far as your exams are concerned. Now, the, the hallmark of narcolepsy is reduced latency of REM sleep. Normally, when you go to bed, when you fall asleep, it takes you like one and a half hours before your first REM sleep starts. It takes around one and a half hours. 
in narcolepsy what happens is the rem sleep kind of intrudes into wakefulness say i'm standing here i'm awake suddenly rem sleep enters what will happen now the symptoms would be easily deducible if we know what happens in the rem sleep the first thing that we know is in rem sleep uh, there is loss of muscle tone usually the uh, in the rest of the body muscle tone is not there except for the eyeballs so if i'm standing here and suddenly rem sleep comes the muscle tone would be lost sudden loss of muscle tone and i may fall down this is a first symptom sudden loss of muscle tone which is also called as cataplexy i'll show you the slide so first thing is sudden loss of muscle tone second we know that it is difficult to awake a person uh, from uh, rem sleep it's a deep sleep in that sense although deep sleep term is used for nrem 3 and 4 but even rem is deep in the sense that it is difficult to wake up a person from rem sleep i, I am in a, a wakefulness of i mean a state of wakefulness and suddenly rem sleep comes so from a state of wakefulness i am going into a stage from where it is difficult to arouse me so what happens is suddenly when the rem sleep comes i feel a very intense or uh, there is a very strong desire to fall asleep the desire is so strong and uh, uh, it is it is something that cannot be stopped that we call it a sleep attack so i am standing and suddenly i will feel very sleepy and i'll sleep in the middle of whatever i am doing say so when i am driving the car suddenly i'll i'll feel so sleepy that i'll uh, fall asleep while driving so this is called as a sleep attack the third thing uh, we said that in rem sleep we dream uh, we we have dreams that we are able to recall later now i am standing here i am awake and suddenly rem sleep comes and in the rem sleep there are dreams so if i suddenly start dreaming while i am awake it would appear as if i am hallucinating and the hallucinations that occur while a person is falling asleep they are called as hypnagogic hallucinations so because of these dreams it may appear as if i am hallucinating and finally uh, there is something called as sleep paralysis again because of the lack of muscle tone so we'll talk about all these symptoms so we talked about the hallucinations hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations also then there is cataplexy which is sudden loss of muscle tone not to be confused with catalepsy catalepsy we talked about catalepsy when we were talking about schizophrenia we said it's a catatonic symptom then there are sleep attacks irresistible urge to sleep and finally sleep paralysis so what is sleep paralysis sometimes it happens to the uh, normal people also Uh, i'm sure sometimes it must have happened to you has it ever happened that you wake up in the morning you are awake uh, but you cannot move yourself you are awake but you just can't move yourself this happens because you have uh, uh, you have woken up but the muscle tone has yet not returned so you are just lying on the bed awake but can't move yourself what do you do you have two options either you can wait for the muscle tone to come back or a better option is you go back to sleep with the hope that next time you will wake up with the muscle tone now this is what happens in these patients frequently sleep paralysis they get up in the morning and they can't move themselves these are the four symptoms and easily deducible if we know the physiology of rem sleep now what causes narcolepsy it's a commonly asked question now the current hypothesis is that narcolepsy is a immune mediated disorder there's a neurotransmitter in the brain called as hypocretin now hypocretin is something uh, which keeps you alert which keeps you active it is believed that because of an immune mediated uh, reaction uh, there is loss of the hypothalamic neurons which produce hypocretin and this deficiency of hypocretin is what causes narcolepsy and evidence in favor of this hypothesis is that narcolepsy is strongly associated with particular hla types so it has been found that narcolepsy is very strongly associated and this exam this question was asked in the exams also pgi as well as jipmer Uh, that there is a strong uh, association with human leukocyte antigen class 2 hla class 2 or hla dr2 to be more precise so this is is further something that tells us that there is something to do with the immune uh, autoimmune uh, system or it's an autoimmune response how do you treat narcolepsy something that promotes the wakefulness will help and the answer is the drug of choice would be modafinil you use modafinil but you also tell the patient to take four snaps you tell him that in the day time after every couple of hours you take a small nap so when you're taking four snaps the chances of having sleep attack goes down you also tell these patients that do not indulge in any dangerous activity uh, 
by yourself i mean you should not be doing any dangerous activity all by yourself for example you should not be uh, driving alone because if you have a sleep attack you might hurt yourself you should not go swimming alone you should not operate heavy machinery alone uh, all because you may have a uh, sleep attack in fact you should avoid all those things this is what is uh, narcolepsy the second disorder that can present with hypersomnia or that presents with hypersomnia is clean levine syndrome now you just need to know the triad of clean levine syndrome there are three symptoms there is hyperphagia hypersomnia and hypersexuality the person sleeps a lot wakes up eats a lot has a lot of sex and goes back to sleep this is also called as perfect life so this is clean levine syndrome and if somebody ask you the drug of choice the answer is again modafinil now if a person is presenting to you with hypersomnia and you cannot find any particular cause for it then we use the diagnosis of primary hypersomnia all right let's talk about insomnia now now again there are certain disorders that can present with insomnia let's talk about them first the first one is periodic limb movement disorder now periodic limb movement disorder is basically characterized by sudden contraction of a muscle group usually the legs the uh, leg muscles suddenly contract while the person is sleeping so the leg muscles suddenly contract and the patient will move now the patient himself is sleeping but he ends up uh, uh, getting the sleep of the partner disturbed so the patient is the husband the wife will say that he keeps on uh, moving in the night also although the patient does not realize at that time uh, his sleep gets disturbed so when he gets up in the morning he would not feel refreshed and he may have daytime sleepiness right so uh, there is uh, daytime sleepiness non restorative sleep what is the meaning of non restorative sleep now insomnia can present with various uh, uh, different types there can be various different manifestations of insomnia one could be difficulty in onset of sleep which means that you go to bed and you are not able to fall asleep then the other could be broken sleep you are going to bed you are falling asleep but it's a broken sleep you keep on getting up again and again or early morning awakening that we talked about when we were talking about depression that you get up more than 2 hours before your usual period and then there can be could be non restorative sleep where you go to bed you sleep okay but when you get up in the morning you don't feel fresh that is what is non restorative sleep and that is why it is usually associated with daytime sleepiness what is the treatment benzos you give benzodiazepines another sleeping disorder that can present with insomnia is restless leg syndrome also known as ichbom syndrome the term ichbom syndrome is also used for delusional parasitosis we talked about delusional parasitosis in chapter 2 so what happens in restless leg syndrome is uh, the person has an uncomfortable sensation when the person goes to bed he is lying down now he has an uncomfortable sensation in the legs he feels as if there are insects crawling on the leg and uh, this this feeling is relieved when he moves the leg or he walks around so the moment he wants to go to sleep he lies down on the bed all these sensations start happening and that is why there is difficulty in the onset of sleep the person keeps on moving the legs or keeps on roaming around so difficulty in the initiation of sleep and the drug that has been approved for rls is ropinirol ropinirol in fact this question was asked in the exams uh, ropinirol is a dopamine agonist remember that all right and finally the third one would be primary insomnia if you cannot find any cause for it so after dysomnias let's talk about parasomnias now parasomnias are basically characterized by some kind of dysfunctional event which is related to sleep so what are these dysfunctional events so parasomnias usually occur uh, in an rem sleep to be more precise an rem stage 3 and 4 so let's talk about these an rem disorders the first one is night terror or sleep terror or pavor nocturnus usually seen in children what happens is the child is sleeping and he sees a scary dream he sees a scary dream he gets up and when he gets up he is looking all flustered he is having autonomic arousal he appears to be frightened but he saw the dream in anarium 3 and 4 so would he be able to recall that dream the answer is no so the history is the child gets up in the night looks all scared after sometimes goes back to bed goes back to sleep wakes up the next day and does not remember anything about the last night he does not remember anything about the last night and even when he gets up in the night he is not able to tell anything about what he saw because all of that is happening in an rem sleep the same thing if it happens in rem sleep say so the child sees a scary dream in the rem sleep gets up 
looks all scared but tells the parents that he saw a bad dream goes back to bed gets up the next day and tells the parents that yesterday he woke up because he had seen a bad dream so when it happens in rem sleep it is called as a nightmare here it is called as a night terror when he does not remember anything all right let's talk about the second nrem disorder it is somnambulism somnambulism is basically sleep walking again the child usually gets up in the night may walk around a bit in some cases it's not just walking a uh, more elaborate activities can be done like dressing up combing hairs there have been case reports of even driving now when he is walking around the child when he is walking around is he completely awake the answer is no he is not completely awake in fact it is difficult to wake him up and it is not even advised to wake him up if you if you forcefully wake up the child or the person who is having somnambulism he may actually get confused and he may even feel that he is being attacked and he may hit you back so if if you find somebody roaming around in the state of somnambulism it is advised that you gently nudge them towards the bed and make them go back to sleep the person is not completely awake this question was asked in neat last year so sleep walking and difficult to awake if if you if you forcefully awake the person he might appear confused may even hit you the next is what is called as sleep related aneurysis again typically seen in children uh, what is the age after which you can make a diagnosis of nocturnal aneurysis the answer is 5 years before 5 years it is considered to be developmentally normal now uh, if you have a person usually a child who is say 6 years old and he complains of aneurysis the parents complain of aneurysis first of all you have to rule out any organic cause although the most common cause is psychogenic it is seen that uh, some psychological factor like sibling rivalry say say uh, the child is of 6 years old and there was a newborn baby uh, his brother was born and uh, this child had achieved uh, urinary continence but after the birth of the brother he again became incontinent now this is what is called as sibling rivalry where uh, he gets kind of jealous of all the attention that the newborn is getting and he may again start having uh, uh, again start uh, having bed wetting just to get back the attention of course it happens at an unconscious level but this this is what is called as sibling rivalry so you just cannot assume that it is a psychogenic cause and you first have to rule out the organic causes because you not know, disorders like diabetes mellitus or diabetes insipidus or utis all of them can present with aneurysis uh, some anatomical causes some obstructions all of them can present with aneurysis if there is daytime aneurysis also there again it goes more towards organic cause psychogenic aneurysis is usually limited to night only then there is there are primary aneurysis versus secondary primary is somebody who had never been continent and secondary is somebody who had achieved continence but again became incontinent so first of all we do all those investigations to rule out an organic cause only then we uh, talk about the uh, psychogenic nocturnal aneurysis if in the exam they ask you what is the treatment of choice for a uh, psychogenic nocturnal aneurysis the answer would be bed alarm which is a kind of a behavioral therapy now in bed alarms what you are doing is you basically put a sensor uh, in the uh, inner ears of the child if the child urinates because of the wetness uh, the sensor would get activated and that further would activate an alarm an alarm would start to ring and the child will get up so basically what you are trying to do is you are trying to create a correlation between the act of getting up and the act of uh, having that sensation of better fullness so basically what happens is when the alarm rings the child has to get up it is quite similar to the pavlov experiment that you must have read in physiology so uh, here what happened in pavlov experiment what happened was uh, uh, the smell of the uh, meat would induce uh, salivation later on when a bell was rung before giving the food the uh, ringing of bell started uh, producing the uh, impact of salivation here also the same thing is happening when you are putting the bed alarm the sound of alarm is waking up the child later on just the sensation of bladder fullness which is preceding the uh, ringing of alarm should be able to make the uh, child get out of the sleep so basically you are creating an conditioned stimuli which in this case would be 
uh, fullness of bladder or sensation of fullness of bladder right you will be able to understand it better when we talk about the last chapter miscellaneous and when we talk about all these experiments in more detail the classical conditioning and the operant conditioning if somebody asks you what is the drug of choice then the answer would be desmopressin the vasopressin analog and you can also use tcas like imipramine but they are like the third line of treatment because they have a lot of side effects then there is bruxism the clenching of jaw or the teeth grinding uh, repetitive uh, teeth grinding may cause damage to the enamel and bruxism is more commonly seen in nrem2 then nrem3 or 4 now what is the treatment for all of those we talked about the enuresis but what about others usually no treatment is required just the parental reassurance you tell the pa parents that it's temporary it would go off it would go away on its own reassuring the parents is enough sometimes if the symptoms are too marked then you can use benzodiazepines uh, why benzodiazepines because benzodiazepines kind of decrease the duration of nrem3 and 4 and most of these things are happening in nrem3 and 4 so that helps now i forgot about sleep talking it is another type of uh, nrem disorder uh, another term for sleep talking is somni loqui s o m n i l o q u y so basically it is talking in sleep and the treatment is reassurance if it doesn't work or if the symptoms are too marked benzodiazepines uh, the other dysomnia is nightmare i already talked about it it happens in rem the child gets up in the night after seeing a scary dream because it happened in rem tells the parents that he saw a bad dream and is able to recall it the next day so this was about the sleep disorders Thank <laughs> you.